Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Angel of Words podcast. I'm your host, Angel of Words. And before we get started, don't forget to click on that notification bell on YouTube. Like, dislike, comment, share. You could also follow us on all podcast platforms. Don't forget, if you want to catch our exclusive content, it is www. A-O-W-E-N-T, and all donations go to Cash App, A-O-W-N-Y-C. Now, on deck, I have the author of the, of the horror fiction novel, Eyes of the Soul, from Harlem via Bronx, New York, Mr. Curtis Holmes. Mr. Holmes, man, thank you for joining us here today on the Angel of the World podcast, brother. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure here, too, and for the audience. Yo, brother, um, you wrote an amazing novel. I got to be honest. I am not into horror fiction at all. I've never been a fan of Stephen King and those dudes. Not that I don't respect their art form. Obviously, I've seen a lot of their uh, of the films based on the novels, and I've enjoyed those. But I've never, I don't think that I've ever in my life actually sat down and, and read a horror fiction novel, ever. This was absolutely brilliant. You know what I'm saying? It, it was action-packed all the way throughout. It had the ebbs and flows that you want on in a novel. What inspired you, man, to get into this horror game and, and start writing horror fiction? Well, I was very much interested in into horror since I was a kid. Okay. And, and I first, as a kid, me and my brother used to actually argue over, well, I'm telling my age right now. Um, I like the chill at theater. And okay. He wanted to watch um, uh, Roger the Rabbit. And we used to go back and forth because I used to love, you know, you know, things that go bump in the night. I was always, as a kid, I was interested in things like, you know, when you're in the house and the house is making noise. I was always interested in investigating exactly what's making this noise and and my imagination was broad i would i would create that maybe it was a ghost maybe it was uh a wizard anything you know of that nature but it started at that age at a young age of 10 right and maybe even younger than that um, my first movie that I actually saw was The Creature from the Black Lagoon. The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Old yeah. school classic, y'all. Yeah. If you're into horror, the, yes. that's um, one of those you got to watch. It was, it was, the monster was just fantastic as it came out of the water and how nothing can stop it. So it was like, to me, it was, I wasn't scared. I was just more fascinated by it and and I always had imagination even when I was in school I didn't know exactly at that age what it was because I used to daydream so much in school I used to sit there I would hear when the teacher is um doing the lesson on the board but if you say green I'm thinking about Martians if you say blue I'm thinking about mermaids it's, it's just certain things that words, meanings of make me go. But I would hear the lesson, but it would make me go to places that, you know, like Star Wars would say or, or Star Trek, no man has gone before. But here's a 10-year-old child, right, just daydreaming. And as I got older, I started writing little um, plays and... Just scrabbling, right? Putting my thoughts, so to speak, on, on paper. And then I was never scared. Like, I was just more interested in, in Psycho. Like, Psycho was the first movie that I really watched and started basing my opinions on how it could be better at 12, 10 years old. And the shower scene. Um, so, and and I really had such a, a devotion to making movies better, right? And what can I do to help? 
And in his cycle, it was the suspense. You know, Alfred Hitchcock was so brilliant. And he, his, his suspenseful buildup, like all the way up into the shower scenes, right? That's what I focused on. That's what, that's what drove me to really write suspense. But it's not as, like today, um, a lot of the audience, they want to see the blood and the gore, the stabbing. But Alfred Hitchcock, he came from a perspective of suspense. What the mind believed that would happen. What's, what's going to take place in a second after a minute has went by. After an hour, what it's the build up, and and it was I was very interested in that, right? And I uh, focus a lot of my my writing on how a lot of great actors and actresses how they become the part, the role. So when I write, the characters I create, a part of me become them them characters as I write, my right? um. And in the book, I had um, Hermes, right? The Carnival, right? These characters that I created came from actually things everyday life. Cause we have Godzilla, we have King Kong. We all know these are monsters, but what is truly a monster? A monster? Is there a monster? that spit fire, Halloween, the stabs, or is it a monster that have on glasses, a briefcase, right? Go to work every day, right? Yeah, like in, like in Psycho, like an American Psycho, you know, like a regular, you know, uh, motel yeah. owner. Wow, I mean, that's crazy, Curtis. And, you know, you, you wrote, you written Eyes of the Soul, which is basically, you know, Kind of based on a a child that is born with a gift. True. You know, it's based on it. And I want you to, you know, show the, you know, the book chair, this Eyes of the Souls that was given to me by Mr. Holmes. I was able to read the book before we got on here. So we're definitely going to get in depth to this. And thank you so much for giving me this. I'm going to ask you to sign this for me before we, uh, sure. before we end, you know, before we end the, well, not before we end the podcast, after the podcast. But, you know. I enjoyed it, and I I I, sp- I really liked Samuel. That's the character who has the gift. And w- where did that stem from? Like, wh- wh- where when did you create the idea? Did you base the novel around him, or was it about the monsters you were just talking about? Well, is it was based around the monsters that I created in the book, but it's also based around how kids all over the world are suffering. And going through things, everyday life, the struggle for a child, right? That loses parents. It's the, it's a, it's a worldly thing. It's a devastating situation sometimes for some kids. Exactly. So, but he succumbed everything, right? And he's moving on, even though, right? As you see in the book, these. Um, supernatural forces is trying to prevent his ever existing, right? And he conquered that. He he rose above that and become the the detective that he is today, right? But as time goes on, he also had a gift that he had to conceal, right? So not to give up everything to the book. Yeah, <laughs> no, definitely but, go buy that. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Eyes but, of the Soul, available now wherever you get your books. You exactly. Know <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting read, and and I'm going to move forward because I'm working on part two of that. Okay. Which would be Shadows of Redemption, right? And... Shadows of Redemption. But start. hold on, let's not get into that. Let's not get into that okay, because we, okay. we still got to talk about <laughs> Eyes of the Soul. We can't talk about t- part two without talking about part one, my brother. Okay. Because you, you know, I mean, you had a loaded book. Your book was, you know, your, exactly. your book had something <laughs> for everyone. There's like pedophilia in the book. There's obviously there's murder. There's rage. But there's also something I wanted to mention. Uh, first is father and son relationship. That dynamic. Versus the mother and daughter relationship, because in the book, 
The mother and daughter relationship seems to be a lot harder to man- maneuver and manage than the father and son relationship. They seem to have a closer bond than the than the people in this book that are mo- that have a mother and daughter relationship. Is that something that comes from uh, what you saw growing up? Like, why did you uh, detail True. that so so closely? True. Because a father and son relationship is unique, right? As like today in time, there's not many fathers and son relationships. Right, there's some, but there's a lot of young kids, you know, in the urban community that grows up, you know, with single parents. So I was trying to show how, like, the parents, that that relationship can exist regardless of what the circumstances or the situation may be. Good can always overcome evil. Right, and no matter what the struggle is, if love is the center of it all, and that's where I was coming from from that perspective of that relationship and bond with uh, Samuel and his father. Okay, okay. I mean that I, I love that, and you also, I mean, look, man, I'm gonna be completely like blunt here. One of the things that I totally enjoyed about the book was the fact that there's something for every, like, community. It's such a New York... It's like if Stephen King was writing something, because, you know, he's from Boston, and a lot of his stuff is, like, Boston-related, you know, Massachusetts-related. You made, like, a horror suspense thriller that was New York hardcore. And I'm talking about old New York, new New York. Like if you were born and raised in New York and you live, breathe the city that's right behind you, you're going to relate to this, whether you're in the, uh, the the LGBTQ community, the horror community, the scientific community, the health community, law enforcement community. You go into details, man. It, you were very educated in these communities and, and what goes on. I mean, from what I can tell, because in order for you to be so descriptive about what's happening in the hospitals in the book, about what's happening in law enforcement in the book, you have to like really delve deep and, and know about this kind of stuff. Is this a lot of stuff that you researched over the years? Because it was very vivid. I felt like I was in the hospitals, in the yeah. law enforcement. It was crazy. Actually, I did a lot of research, but some is based on my own experience. Okay. And and what I seen as a kid growing up, because I know I was born and raised in New York. Mm -hmm. I've been in New York all my life. And being in New York coming up the way I did, you know, it's a it's an experience of a lifetime. You know, you you be exposed as a kid to everything. And I was giving up a little bit of my experience from from law enforcement, from um, being in a hospital and things of that nature. And um, that's how I, I really, it, it, it wasn't hard because uh, I had so much experience in doing research of broadly. New York City is is a city that never sleeps. And as I've written in my book, I was expressing myself to, from my perspective and and then not a not in a large detail, but in my own way. No, no, you. I mean, you did. It's as detailed as you're ever gonna get. Like if you if you love New York and you want to know what happens in different communities, man, this is definitely the book for you. Um, now, it's graphic. It's sick. There's a lot of stuff going on here, man. It's not for the uh, the the meek of heart, if you will, you know. Um, but it, it, it was also done in a taste. I mean, I mean, as tasteful as you can be for horror fiction. It's not like the whole book is blood, guts, and gore all the way throughout. There is a a fantastic storyline that brews throughout the whole novel. But you know, when you're writing a horror fiction novel, is it? Do you do you have that always on your conscience to make sure that you don't oversaturate the novel with too much gore and and too much horror that there is some form of storyline that's happening? True, because I don't I don't allow myself to to get too far into blood and gore because I'm I'm more or less trying to leave into suspense. Like I'm really like I really want to give my audience the 
what if, right? I want them to, to like you know, um, Alfred Hitchcock. He his his method of making movies was just extraordinary, and I sat down and really studied him from the birds, and um, I try to, I like many great actors and actresses, when I write, I try to become that character, the mindset of that character, right? Uh, I actually try to become, right, what would this character do? What's on his mind? What did he go through? What did she go through in her life to get there? And, and, and I come up with so many things. And honestly, uh, uh, I tape it down a little bit because, you know, as uh, I mentioned before, I was, I'm a fan of horror, right? And thriller suspense. But I'm really into trying to make uh, the audience feel, right? What's, what, what if? I want, I want, I want the audience to say, "What if this is true? Who's around the corner?" Right? When we was coming up as kids, you know, we used to take our girlfriends to the movie theater, and that was the that was the time. Like I get, I said again, I'm telling my age, that was the time where, you know, you could you could protect the young lady you're with. Because she's she's closing her eyes. See, I want I want the audience to feel right when they watch it. I want them to become part of the movie, the part of the book, right? And suspense, right? Like in like um, in Psycho, the shower scene. You didn't see as to like today the the knife going into the flesh. It's it, it's the suspenseful buildup, and as as I go on with many other books that I have that I'll be working on, um, that's that's the direction I'm taking. Suspense, right? But as I said before, I do love horror, but I'm leaning more towards thriller suspense. Okay, okay. And you know, and I noticed, uh, I'm gonna mention just one scene in the book, you know what I mean? Because I don't want to give too much away. Um, but I see where you're coming from because there's a character called Hermes who is a psycho who's stalking a lady by the name of Joyce. And um, when you're describing it, it's the buildup. And it gets you to the point where you're like, yo, how is he going to kill this lady? Is she even going to die? And that was fantastic. And throughout the novel, it is like that, the way that you describe all the... Because there's various serial killers in the novel, folks. Like, you know, the the novel is about a a boy with a gift who, you know, like you said, eventually becomes a detective and, you know, takes care of business all across the board. Um, So when when you're reading that, you know, Curtis really makes you, like shit in your pants before you really shit in your pants, for, for lack of a better <laughs> term. Now, I I also want to talk about the technological aspect of the book, because I would, you know, I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit confused. Uh, we had this conversation earlier um, because, you know, the book is set like kind of 70s, 80-ish times, but then there's like these you know, there's biotechnical engineering involved. So it was kind of confusing. But the reason why is because this was your vision. And I, I want you to elaborate on that more because that was kind of confusing because that's something that the, those terms are something that are kind of modern. But this is set in the 80s. And I want you to explain why that was. Well, I wanted to um, more or less bring about, see, the the bi- is just a front. It's like it's. The hidden agency behind that. Yeah, the is Bureau like, of uh, Scientific Affairs, yeah, yeah. is it? Right, you created but, this whole new thing. There's no such thing as the Bureau of exactly, Scientific exactly, Affairs, right? Exactly, right? Exactly. I was bugging. I had to Google it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but but behind the scenes, yeah. right, that's, mm-hmm. they are an entity that's interested in, you know, things from different worlds. Like, um, the supernatural, if you will. yeah. Anything that the public is not aware of, right? Similar to, you could say, what um, the CIA, the 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 um, Israel's 
CIA, or the hidden, Mossad, I think yeah, they call it, right? The Illuminati, yeah. things like that. Okay. All right, and that's the direction I was trying to take that. Like, the public is not aware of this, 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 this organization. Okay, the like the Men in Black, if you will, for the new yeah, people. you can say for, that for yeah. the younger generation. You know? <laughs> yeah, you can say that, but got you. But more from a in a serious perspective. Yeah. Right. That they really into things like. Um, UFOs, things of things that that the the average citizen, right, throughout the world, that's not aware, of, right, that they don't expose to the public, right, and um, and it was after Samuel, you know, they came aware to him, mm -hmm. you know, his ability as a kid, and um, and the adventure goes on. Oh, yeah. and on and on and on. Yes. The beat don't yeah. stop until the early <laughs> morning. <you know? laughs> yes, indeed. And but that's that's where I was I was taking that more 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 or less. I was I was trying to create a agency that was into uh, you know the supernatural, biochemistry, anything that they could come up with for different diseases, anything that's extraordinary. They, they they was involved in, and Sammy was an extraordinary kid. Was he, man? Wow! Yeah. It was yeah. great to see him coming of age, man. Honestly, throughout the throughout yeah. the novel. Yes, um, I really wanted to go on with it, but um, a publishing company advised me, you know, to taper it down because the book was actually really six hundred pages. Yeah, right? no, you were telling me that it was six hundred, yeah. written by hand. Yes. <laughs> you wrote this book by hand, bro. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> so it was a, it, it's a lot more to the book. Yeah. But, you know, um, I was advised by the publishing company to um, yeah. to taper it down a little. Okay. So not to take anything from the audience, yeah. right? Or the readers. Yeah, but I mean there's really I mean, I don't I've never read the six hundred page manuscript, but the three hundred plus page uh yeah. book that you've wrote, written was it was absolutely fun. It was a fun read, you know? Thank you. No, you're welcome. Now, you know, you, you, we were discussing that you wrote the book by hand. Like, did you did you have a typist after? Like, how did, what was that process like after you wrote the book? Oh, it's, it's, it's my imagination, right, only kicks in with a pen and paper. Got you. Um, I can't, I can't really focus. It won't flow on a typewriter. Okay. Right, so most of my writing is with pen and paper. And sometimes I can't even, it won't even kick in with a pen. I need a pencil, right? And and that's how I could be able to put my thoughts, my feelings and everything. But I credit it a lot to some actors because actors and actresses, they, uh, they work so hard and to become someone else is something amazing and and that's how I use that as example for when I write. Uh, like I said before, I, I, I try to become that character, right? To think and feel like that character. So the audience can feel that character, right? And I, like again, I want them to say, what if, right? It's amazing how some people that read the book say, is this true, right? And it's only fiction, right? It's 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 it's, it's the part that's true. Well, right? I, I want to make them wonder. That's the, that's the point I'm trying to wonder. What if? I want them sitting there reading and saying, even having to put it down for a moment, and then as they walk on during the day, wonder if this is true. Could this really happen? Because that's what um, Alfred Hitchcock did. He he worked on a person's imagination, right? And and that's and I, and I love that, right? That's how. Um, hopefully, as the future unwinds, I get better and better. Because I'm trying to please my audience, right? And it's a wonderful thing when you can sit down, and we all got to serve. We all want to make money, survive, right? We got bills. But when you could do something that you have a passion to do, something that you really love, money is, 
is not the, really the focal point because you're doing something you really love. But, and I love writing. I love movies, right? I love reading books, right? So I'm really enjoying myself right now. Well, that's fantastic. Now, can I'm going to ask you a question. Was it, were you embarrassed or bullied for having such a large imagination as a child? Be, and, or were you even ashamed to express that to people? Oh, exactly. Yes. Um, I always daydreamed as a child, right? Um, I really didn't express myself much. I was a quiet child. I wrote a lot. And... Um, I would never allow people to actually witness, right? You know, my imagination and the things that I thought about. And my, although my mother knew, you know, she would watch me and and she would see that I was really interested in in, in Abbott and Constetto meet meet the the Bunsters and like the Mummy, yeah. and Dracula, and Frankenstein. That was one of my favorites. Um, and the concept of of underworld, the concept of underworld, uh, most people don't aware of it. It came out in in the seventies, and the movie was Frankenstein's Bloody Terror, right? That's the concept of a certain amount of vampires uh, battling werewolves, and um, I was always interested in werewolves and vampires and the mummy. And just Dracula. I was into all that. But as I mentioned before, what is what is truly a monster? Right? And 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 a monster at a child would be, you know, creature from the black lagoon, you know, the mummy, Dracula. But the real monster is the everyday person that whom walk amongst us, you know, take the kids to school. It's the mindset, right? And and I did a little reading on you know, FBI files and uh, files of serial killers and things like that. Like, and I was like amazed that, you know, like the Green River Killer, right? Some, some monsters are, uh, are handsome, some monsters are beautiful. Right, and the list can go on and on. Ted Bundy, yeah, Ted Bundy was amazing. Right, he was like, you would never, never think that he was a monster. So, what is truly evil? Right, is it Godzilla or is it Ted Bundy? Albert Fish, one of the horrific, one of the horrific fil- um, serial killers that ever was from New York City. So you're like a serial killer connoisseur, man. I mean, <laughs> not connoisseur, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, educator on the uh, serial killer uh, yeah. situation. And could you imagine, like I said, that these serial killers are back on Earth and can never die? That is horror in itself, right? And... And, and a certain people asked me, they read the book, they said, could that be? And I, and I always respond to them as saying, what if? What if is if the Zodiac Killer is back? Albert Fish, the son of Sam. Well, apparently the son of Sam was a huge network of sadists that still exist all across America. Well, from my understanding, <laughs> from my understanding right now, Dave, <clears throat> David Berkowitz is still alive, I believe. Yeah. I believe. Last time that I did any research and read up on him, you know, he was a Christian guy, born again Christian, and he was in Sullivan Correctional Facility in upstate New York. Yeah. Um, but. Could you imagine the Zodiac Killer, Jack the Ripper? The list can go on and on. Yeah, man. It's, right? It's, and It's scary. Yeah. You're yeah. scaring me right now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're a brilliant storyteller, man. Wow. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah. And it is the oh, by the way, this is the October, the month of horror, treats, sweets, 
and uh, yeah. you know uh, uh, mystical beings in the supernatural. You know, because Halloween is around the way. So yeah. this is kind of like our Halloween special. So thank you for coming on here with such a great novel. You know, to share with people to buy for people for Halloween as a as a treat. You know definitely. what I mean? So thank definitely, you. thank you for having me. No, no, definitely no. But you know, the the fun continues because. Uh, you mentioned to me before that because you love horror so much, right? It 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 kind of how do you say it? It you're very hard on yourself when you're when you're writing these books. True, true. And, and, and why is that? It's because I want. I love, I want to please the audience. Okay. They're right. Um, the audience is the motivation to put, you know, your craft on paper and have someone read it, like most writers. They want, it's, the, it's to please the audience, right, the reader, and to get into their mind as they read each sentence, each paragraph, right, and entertain now, talking about the audience, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this situation because I remember we had this conversation as well uh, before um, when we first met. And you were telling me because, you know, you are this big, black, beautiful man that sometimes people Thank don't you. believe that you wrote this book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, I and, and I find that so disconcerting that in this day and age in America, like we really believe that things have to come from like a certain uh, area yes, in order yes, to be feasible. I, true, I, true. I definitely experienced that. You know, um, um, some some people that read the book, you know, because I had a book signing and they was amazed that, you know, they would think that I'm supposed to be on the uh, a middle linebacker for the New York Giants. Yeah, like you yeah. played football before. Yeah. Like you're not supposed to be writing yeah. novels. What's wrong with you? I don't know, but <laughs> it, it, it is funny. Yeah, it is funny. It's, 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 it's I guess it's people's perspective. You know how mm -hmm. they view, you know, certain writers, and I don't know. I don't know, but yeah. Does it, it so it doesn't bother you? You just you just laugh it off type of situation. Yeah, no, it doesn't bother me, but yeah. it's it's actually fun. Okay, right? <laughs> explain. Like, tell yeah, us why. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's like it's like you know people expectations sometimes like you like how could you write this? Yeah. <laughs> what a mess, right? man! That's crazy. What is going on with you? Like yeah. you know, they wondering like most people that read the book they say. No, where is it? What is wrong with you? They even they go so far as that, and all I say is you know, my response is that it's entertainment, right? I'm trying to entertain you, just like you know the the movie Halloween, you know the Exorcist, and then speak about the Exorcist. That was one of the only true movies that actually scared me. Oh wow! Okay. Right, so me too. The Exorcist is a scary son you know, of a gun, especially that, that original one. Yeah, the, the the first one. You know, I was ten years old. Again, I'm telling my age, but it really scared me. That was about the only movie that really frightened me. But also, again, I was ten, and um, but I I loved it then. I loved it to be scared more sex, and and I knew that. At that point, that uh, eventually one day I would write, and to speak on that, I had the opportunity to meet a brother by the name of Jules Rutledge. Most people would know him. He had, he was the author and the owner and publisher of Felon Magazine, and he always used to tell me, "You know, you have imagination, right? You should start writing." And he used to push me and push me for months on in, push me. And I always had the thought that I had to be an excellent writer. You had to, you know, have a flair for writing. And he explained to me, he said, no, Curtis. He said, oh, you have this imagination that some editors 
and this is how he put it. He said, Curtis, he said, editor, most editors are writers without imagination. So I didn't understand at that point until I started writing. He said, Curtis, don't worry about penmanship. He said, you write from your heart and you edit from your mind. And I took that advice and I kept going. You know? And one page turned into 20 pages and 20 pages turned into 100 pages. And 100 pages for me at this point is turning into a lifetime. Right, it, it changed so much in me that I have a passion for writing and I love it. It's something that I want to do for the rest of my life. If it was up to me, I would help everybody, right? From The Walking Dead, I sit and watch The Walking Dead and, and, and say to myself, how do I want to help them so much in their writing? I know they may have, you know, hundreds of writers, but I just, love writing and at one point I'm actually you know interested in directing movies but that's late on in my life yeah. but that's 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 my passion horror slash thriller suspense so you want to be an icon in that field true honestly true that's that's my direction okay I'm going to tell you, The Walking Dead just needs a little help. It's been on for a long time. It's kind of dragging ass. I stopped well, watching well, it after like season seven. It's already well, like well, 11 or something like that. Well, I'm interested in helping. I have so much to give. Yeah, I mean, they need. I feel like they need fresh blood, man. That'll be fantastic if you become a writer on The Walking Dead. Now, speaking about that and screenplays and things of that nature, I mean, I noticed that there's a few scenes in the in the novel Eyes of the Soul, actually, and we're here talking to Curtis Holmes, the brilliant author of Eyes of the Soul, which is a fantastic horror thriller novel. Now, I remember you mentioning tennis, and not tennis, racquetball and handball in this book right, in this novel, and you also have a script, you said, that you've written called Off the Wall. Is that something that always intrigued you, tennis and handball? Is it something you played a lot growing up? Well, actually, I wanted to test myself. I wanted to see can I can move away from, you know, horror, thriller, suspense. And I came up with, you know, as a kid growing up, you know, Handball is played all over my neighborhood, right? And it's never been a movie focused on focused actually on handball, right? And it's an excellent, you know, you know, sport slash activity, you know, in a sense. And I, I created this character who actually was a talented handball player, and he crossed over to tennis, and he used his handball ta talents to win the Wilmington. Wow. We're going to leave it there because I don't want you to give too much because then if somebody's listening, they'll fucking, you know, take the stone. <laughs> they'll take the shit away. <laughs> you, know, you never know. But that being said, who was your favorite um, serial killer to write about in Eyes of the Soul? Mm. Mm. Actually. To create. Actually, it was Hermes. I okay. have this. Hermes. All right. He, and he's a germ. He comes from a German background yeah, from yeah. the Third Reich out, you know, from the World War II and and that whole, you know, unfortunate disaster and uh, uh, situation that happened in, you know, in, in World War II with the Jews. And, you know, he he, he, he stems from that um, from that era and he mm. escapes Germany, Nazi Germany uh, during the Inquisition, you know, when everybody, you know, when the allies were taking over and he comes out to America and yeah. starts running amok for years. True. That's scary, bro. But see, Hermes was actually the builder. Yeah. Um, I use him to introduce Hitler. Okay. See, because, you know, Hitler... As you know, he passed the six month, the six day, mm -hmm. at the six hour. Mm -hmm. And he became exactly who he was. And he cannot die. And um, they actually, again, I don't want to tell most of the, the, the book, yeah. but, you know, um, 
he was the uh, Hermes was actually the build up for Hitler. Okay. Right? Because you know Hitler was the ultimate evil. Yeah. Right. But I just wanted to use Hermes as a little you know, sprinkle. Yeah. As right? a setup, a springboard to, yeah. to, to to the real evil. Exactly. That is Mr. Hitler. But I have so much, right? And I'm working on several, you know, projects now, part two of uh Eyes of the Soul. Um I will actually after after that, I'm completion of that. I'm working on part two of Off the Wall, okay. uh, a screenplay that I wrote. That I'm actually what should we what should be what should we be expecting in the second part of our Eyes to the Soul? Because if there's anything as good as part one, man, I'm gonna be like, I'm I'm scared to even think, man. <laughs> well, I will I will give you this much. All right, cool. And, and part two of Eyes of the Soul, which will right now would be. Shadows of Redemption, you know, Hitler is in a 30 by 60 steel cage in a cassette builder in Jerusalem, right? And it's going to be a, a world trial. And I'm going to leave it at that. What will Samuel be in part two? Well, Samuel's coming. All right. It is what it is. <laughs> All right. And with that being said, we reached a point in the podcast where it's time to play, Mr. Holmes, five words with Angel. Now, yes. Now, Mr. Holmes, on Five Words with Angel, I'm going to give you a word, phrase, or a question, and you're going to give me the first uh, word, phrase, or thought that comes to your head. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. The first, uh, the first one is a question on Five Words with Angel. It's, what's your favorite horror movie of all time? And it have to start with an A. No, it doesn't have to start with it. It could be whatever it is. The Exorcist. The Exorcist is your favorite horror movie of all time, even though it scared the bejesus out of you. Yes. It is your favorite horror movie of all time. Yes. All right. I'm feeling yes. that. All right. Yes. Good. All right. So the next question is, Mr. Holmes here on Five Words with Angel, the horror movie that scared you the most, which we found out already, is The Exorcist. The Exorcist. Who, okay. So who runs in second? What's the second most scariest Ooh. situation? The Blob. The Blob scared you like crazy. All right. The, what do you think the about old, the old and the new? The old and the new one you thought were fantastic. Yeah. What do you think about Nightmare on Elm Street and and Friday the Thirteenth and Mike Myers and all? Because that oh. was like my era. Like, did you well, appreciate those movies? Actually, um, Friday the Thirteenth. Because that's my that, that's like my was, second was scariest. was exciting. Yeah, but Halloween actually was intriguing. Yeah. It's like. Michael Myers was just fantastic. His yeah. his they the way they wrote it, directed it was fantastic. Out of Loved those three, it. which one do you like that the most? You like the Halloween series more than Friday the thirteenth and uh and Nightmare on Elm Street? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. I don't Nightmare on Elm Street is not even in my list. Oh, all right, cool. Okay. Not even on your list. I love no. it. All right. Keeping it keeping it real here on the Five Words with Angel. All right. All right. So your uh the next uh question here on Five Words with Angel is what's your favorite villain in Eyes of the Soul? And it could be anyone because there were some scientists that were villains. There were some villains in this book. Doesn't have to be one of the serial killers. Ooh. Who's the favorite? Who was your favorite evil person? Your favorite villain? In this book to write, or yeah. not even to write, that you like as a as a as a fan of your own work. Actually, I didn't like any of them, right? Personally, but when I created Carnival, yeah, right, the Carnival, right, was just evil. He was right. I was actually fearful of the Carnival. As wow. I as I wrote, and that's why I had to. You know, although I brought him back at the end, yeah, I saw right? that. But why'd you do that? Right, because it's a backstory to. Okay, it's a backstory. Yeah, I found that a little yeah. like really. Why yeah. did you do that? For yeah, it's, it's, I had to ask you about. It's that. a backstory. Okay, right, and I may I may introduce the backstory later on. Okay, on how he. Became who he was. Okay. And I gave a little bit um, 
to the audience, to my readers, when you when you hear him, you know, whispering that sadistic uh, melody. Yeah, that shit's like, scary as hell. Like, I could just exactly. think, like I'm listening because you know I love music, so yeah, I'm like, it's like, yeah. it's like, it's it's it, it's a backstory to him. Okay, right. Um, that it was hard to do. Yeah, right. To create him. Yeah, right. But he had to be horrific. He had to be. And by the right. way, folks, the that the, the 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 actual novel starts with this villain. So once you get once you start reading that, it's like it's all yeah. uphill from I mean, you know, uh downhill in a good way from there because it, it just gets more and more intriguing. But you start off the book with the carnival. And is that why you wanted to do it? Because you, you enjoyed him so much? Because you could have started with a lot of other characters here in this book. No, you didn't need to start with him. I actually started with him, right, to to get the reader involved. Got you. Right. You know, to to have them to turn the pages. Entertainment. Right. And just like Halloween, just like, you know, the Exorcist. For me, that was when I say the Exorcist, to have the little girl, right, with the crawl scene was just horrific. Like it was it was it was artful. Right, but at that at that age, you know, I, it was just I was scared, right? And that feeling, right? I wanted to capture, right, the reader, right? That's where I, I introduced him, and then I got rid of him. Then I brought him back because later on I'm gonna introduce the backstory on him, right? Then I get rid of him again. Right, you know, just being creative, and um, although um, I love horror and thriller suspense, it's is so much more to my imagination. Got you, right? You know, but um, uh, I'm just I'm just so in love with writing, right? Allowing my imagination be introduced to the world. Hey man, and now the fourth, it's funny you said that because the, the, the fourth word on five words with Angel, right? Is because you you do love the world, but you are from New York City. What's your favorite borough in New York City, man? Ooh. That's a cool I know one. it's not Queens. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I like, I actually, I actually, yeah. um, I actually like Queens. Okay. I actually like Brooklyn. Yeah. Right, but I love Manhattan. Okay, so Manhattan is your favorite borough. Okay, mine's too. You know. Yeah, I actually. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I like I like Manhattan. Yeah, what's not to like about it, man? There's so much going on. Yeah, experience. yeah, it's true. And then now mentioning what you were just mentioning as well, piggybacking off of that, the fifth word on five words with Angel is writing. What do you think about when you think about writing? Oh, that is such an excellent. I can go on forever. Go ahead, man. It's writing is I can I can leave this place. No matter what's going on in the world, no matter how I'm feeling, right? I can leave. I have a place to go when I'm writing. I'm not here anymore. My imagination is so broad and and I like those places. I like that feeling. You no, know, cause I I wake up like one in the morning, and something will come to me. Right, I go to the bathroom. I write it down. I go to my little pad. I write it down. And um, I dream. I dream even when I'm walking, which is dangerous. <laughs> but writing just became a part of my life. I enjoy it. I love it. It's nothing like it. You know, people love basketball, music, you know, dancing. You know, I love writing. I love watching movies. You know, I love reading. 
Well, that's what's up. Now, what would you, you know, what what would you tell any little boy or girl that has a wild imagination? Because you know, you just you just mentioned earlier on in this podcast that it was hard for you to 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 express that to other people because it was it was it was stigmatized. It was a taboo around having such a wild imagination. Because then people start thinking that you're crazy, that you're schizophrenic. You know, it's unfortunate they want to give you these pills now if you're a kid. But what would you tell a kid that has this wild imagination that wants to put a pen to pad or want to put fingers to keyboard and, 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 and make things happen. What would you tell this little kid about, you know, about going after what what his imagination and, you know, making well, things happen? I, I would tell most kids, teenagers, even though okay. that whatever passion you have, right, don't let negative opinion sway you, right? Even if it does for that moment, but don't give up, right? Just keep, right, moving on, but never, never give up, right? Because once you give up, you will allow the world to hinder you to something that can be so great that's inside you. And I would tell Anybody, not just kids, teenagers, adults, keep pushing because things will get better. Your opportunity will come. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the people that I've met, right, because uh, who really swayed me and, and, and taught me the fundamentals of writing movie scripts was... A uh, white guy by the name of Danny Baines. Shout out to Danny Baines. Yes, yeah. you told me the story. Yeah, he's from he's from Detroit, and um, he took the time out to teach me how to write movie scripts and push me. And from him, he introduced me to a a guy by the name of Tony Mays from Texas. And you know the difference between the two is that Danny was more of a stylist when he wrote. He had a flair about how he write and. Um, Tony Mays, he was a grammarist. He wanted everything perfect. He actually did not. He he did not like mistakes. I he, I would give him a paper, and when it came back, red everywhere. So, he he between the two of them, they really pushed me to excellence. And even now, I still make mistakes. Sometimes I write. And my imagination that take me somewhere else. Like, you know, sometimes you, you know, when you write a book, you're telling the story. When you write a movie script, you know, you're showing the story. So sometimes I, I tend to get confused when my imagination, I, I'm, and I'm not there, I'm so into the story that I lose focus on the rules, right, of writing. Yeah, you know, like especially the movie script. You know, the screenplay is rules that you, you know. Yeah, no, that you mean there's strict you know? rules. People will throw yeah. your script away if you're not exactly. following those rules. So sometimes when I'm writing, I'll be so much into the story, I tend to slip, and that's where you know edit is involved. You got to write and rewrite. You know, sometimes I might rewrite five, six times the whole script. You know, corrections, right? So I don't know. I go through that now. Right, so what I do now is that I take my time and I work on one manuscript at a time and one screenplay at a time. Before, when I when I was just learning, I I do both, and I was making a lot of mistakes, and that's where Tony Mays came involved. You know, you, you know, it's a certain it's it's different when you know you didn't wrote ninety pages of your heart, and and when it come back. All ninety pages is full of red, so you know that's that's hard to do. Yeah, you know, no, it's not kid, fun. You know? it's not, <laughs> that's hard to do, but it's not fun at all. You know, God bless them, and um, you know, I learned a lot between both of them. And um, now, Curtis, up. what would you have to tell to any you know major publishing company that wants to hire you and make you sign a book deal or something of that nature? Why should they want to work with Curtis Holmes? Well, I have so much to give to. The world of writing, I have so much to give to production companies, 
by anybody that's interested in uh, a new face, a new look. Yeah. In the direction of thriller suspense, horror, inspiring movies such as Off the Wall. Um, I have a, a a project I'm working on as well. I say by next year sometime. Um, Clash of Hands, Heart of a Champion, right? Which is more leaning towards uh, a boxing movie, right? And I, I have so, so I got so much to, to give, you know, to production companies, publishing companies, you know, to the world. That's great. Now, now, I, I, and I, I'm really happy, man, that I met you, and I'm glad that you put this on me. It was crazy how you just handed to me the, 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 this piece of paper in the middle of nowhere with the yeah. synopsis on the back. Now, I want you to tell the public before we end the podcast where we can find your novel, how can we get our hands on it, how can we find Curtis Holmes if we want to get in contact with Well, um, my publishing company is Newman Springs Publishing Company out of New Jersey, right? Um, you can reach me at my my email is curtisholmes183 at gmail.com. Um, you can reach me through Angel. There you yes, go. Yeah, yeah, definitely reach out to me um, at Angel of Words ENT. All one word, you know that. I'll get you in contact with Curtis ASAP, but you got to be serious because you know I don't play. <laughs> True. You will not get in contact with Curtis if you don't have no real offers of help here. Seriously, because the man works hard, bro. 306 yes. page novel that's action packed all the way throughout and interesting is not easy to write, sir. I would never write. I'm writing a novel. I don't know if I'm going to be able to reach 306 pages, you know, of action packed. I'm trying to condense mine to like 250. Oh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, definitely. So it's not, you know, it's not an easy task. True. Not an but, easy task. But it, it becomes easy when. You love what you do. Yeah, yeah. When you have a passion for it, it's not considered work. Yeah. Right, so, you know, I actually, in the beginning it was hard, but now I, I enjoy it so much and um, I'm grateful, right? And um, I'm just, you know, ready to work. My man Curtis Holmes is ready to work. My brother, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, man. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you today. Everyone, that was Mr. Curtis Holmes, the author of the horrific uh, uh, fiction uh, thriller, Suspense. Eyes of the Soul, available wherever you get your books. You can also find it on Amazon, correct? Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. That was Mr. Holmes here on the Angel of Words podcast. Everyone, before we end, do not forget to subscribe on YouTube. Share these messages. Like, comment. Let people know what's up. We're here spreading your stories because this is where your stories are heard. You could also uh, find this on all podcast platforms at Angel of Words. E and I mean, Angel of Words podcast on all the podcast platforms, including Anchor, Spotify, and Apple. You could also catch our exclusive content at www.aowent.com and if you want to leave a donation you know it's cash app AOWNYC thank you for tuning in everyone and we will talk to you later